It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Farewell, Leicester Square. It's a long, long way to Tipperary, but my heart's right there. And, uh... We're, well, I welcome you to this presentation. Um, I'm, I've got a brief introduction, and, uh, and then the president will come to, to speak to us this evening. Now, let's set the stage. Um, this is a special appearance of the 28th president, Thomas Woodrow Wilson. It is the evening of September the 25th, 1919. The Great War has been over for 10, ten months. We are in Pueblo, Colorado. It is the 21st day of Wilson's arduous round-the-country speaking tour to win public support for the League of Nations, a project he helped design and believed in passionately. His hope, utterly utopian to our present age, or is it, was the League that would banish future wars and lead mankind into a new era of permanent peace and universal democracy. That fall, however, the League was in trouble in the United States Sen Senate which had to approve it by at least a two-thirds vote. In 1919, however, Republicans held a public a Senate majority, and to varying degrees, they, and particularly Senator, Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., wanted the League Covenant revised to ensure American sovereignty, which they believed the draft covenant endangered, especially Article 10 of 26, which they claimed stripped co from Congress the power to take us to war. A minority of Wilson's foes, the irreconcilables, wanted no league at all. So Wilson took his case on the road to appeal directly to the public for support of an unamended league. Though he was apparently winning the public over, there was a mounting problem. His exhausting tour was bringing him to, the, to collapse. In three weeks, he had given 36 major addresses and eight minor ones. He had already suffered a small stroke in July, and while he was rallying s popular support, he was wearing out faster. Hours after the Pueblo speech, he broke down completely, and his doctor canceled the rest of the tour. Reluctantly bowing to the inevitable, Wilson looked out the train window, tears streaming, and said, quote, Lodge will say I'm a quitter, unquote. The rest is high tragedy. He suffered a major stroke three days later. His beloved league died on the Senate floor, and he endured the last one and a half years of his presidency an invalid, believing to the end that without the league, the world would be thrown into major war within gener a generation. A final note about the illustrations accompanying Wilson's address. Nearly all are selections from graphic materials of the World War I era the largest number being cartoons from the nation's leading newspapers. Now, let us return to that evening in Pueblo's new civic hall, where, as program chairman or chairwoman, I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm Colorado welcome to the man who is striving to make the world safe for democracy, the President of the United States, the Honorable Woodrow Wilson. Mr. Chairman and fellow citizens, it is with a great deal of genuine pleasure that I find myself in Pueblo, Colorado, and I take it as a compliment that I am to be the first speaker in your new hall. One advantage of it, as I look about, is that you are not too far away from me, because there is nothing so reassuring and pleasurable to men who are trying to express the public sentiment as getting into real personal contact with their fellow citizens. But I have had, if I may call them, unpleasurable experiences as well as I've crossed the continent. I perceive more and more 
that men are busy creating an absolutely false impression of what the Treaty of Peace and the Covenant of the League of Nations contains and means. I find further that there is an organized propaganda against the Treaty and League coming from exactly the same sources. It is to do away with these false impressions that I want to tell you a few simple things about two essential things, the Treaty and the Covenant of the League. To tell you convincingly, however, and to suggest why gentlemen have organized their propaganda, I find that I must first go to the origin of the two key ideas to grow up out of this war. One of permanent world peace, the other of a league of nations which will act as the instrument of that peace. Both have their origins for me in the fundamental meaning of the American experiment and the world policies which that experiment implies, no, mandates if we would be true to our founding and history. Further, these are ideas that have guided me all of my adult life, especially since the beginning of the recent war some 10 months ago. The America I know is more than a rich and powerful nation. It has something else besides physical strength behind it. America is a great spiritual concept, and that is the one thing that the rest of the world cannot permanently resist. And the spirit of America is peace, and it is a spirit profoundly concerned with peace. We are also a nation with a mission, not a mission to help ourselves, but to serve mankind. Since the first years of our founding, there was the hope that it might, in all it was and did, show mankind the way to liberty. Now, traditionally, traditionally, this missionary impulse has been a passive one of serving by good example. But the time has come for us to play an active missionary role and lead the old world into a new era of peace and justice anchored on a concert, a league of nations. <laughs> now, critics, critics say that I am utopian, a modern-day Don Quixote. <laughs> well, I say to that that America itself is idealistic. With its mission of service, it is, in fact, the only idealistic nation in the world. And idealism will save the world. Selfishness and provincialism will only embroil it. Pardon. In late November of 1916, I felt the time had come for us to give a concrete expression to this missionary impulse. What I thought to do was to approach each of the warring powers in such a way as would generate the first step toward peace, putting the break on the blind and deadly momentum of war. If, excuse me, if human exhaustion, if human exhaustion could influence the taking of that step, then that fall was very nearly the time, if not the time itself, for our people to move for peace. You see, the long 
and deadly battle on the Somme, that just ended, had cost the Allies a shocking 600,000 killed and wounded. And the Central Powers, nearly that number, and the men in those horrid trenches were almost unanimous for peace. If the contests were allowed to continue by such attrition, if million after million of human lives could be offered up until there were no more to offer, if, if feelings of resentment could be kindled that would never die, our hopes for a lasting peace would forever elude us. Now, certainly as a neutral nation whose fortunes, uh, rights, and policies were deeply affected by the war, our nation had a clear right to ask the warring powers to make peace. Neutrality, in fact, would, would give us an advantage in doing this. I would go so far as to say that neutrality vouchsafed a special blessing to us. If a universal catastrophe was to be avoided, some part of the great family of nations must keep the processes of peace alive. Our nation, by remaining at peace and fit and free, was in a unique position to serve as mediator to the world. And I know that God intended us to play that role. Well, in December of 1916, December, what I decided to do was to ask, and by the way, the gentlemen were already setting themselves against me. What I decided to do was to ask each set of the warring powers to tell the world well, they had not yet done so, what conditions and positions, if attained, would satisfy them. Then, if each set of replies proved at least minimally acceptable to the other side, my hope was that we would go into conference for the purpose of forging a general and, God willing, permanent peace. Sadly, if the men in those horrid trenches hungered for peace, their political and military leaders wanted only victory. Moreover, each side lambasted the other side using my proposal as the pretext. And sometimes they went after me. The Allies told me that discussions of peace could not begin until victory was won. Otherwise, autocratic Germany, autocratic Germany would never yield up its determination to rule all of Europe. They also said that my proposal made no moral distinction between the two sides, showing my total failure to understand that British democracy was upholding at an appalling sacrifice the very principles they thought we also lived by. <laughs> Some even questioned our courage. One English leader charged that it was fear of the submarine and of ourselves becoming embroiled in war that lay behind my haste. My haste, can you imagine? my haste to arrange a peace. Well, as for the Germans, as for the Germans who had submitted a very suspect peace proposal of their own just days before mine, they replied with equal acidity. The Kaiser himself pummeled the Entente powers for their arrogant criminal rejection of his peace proposal and declared that now the war must continue until the inevitable German victory. But early in the New World, 
in the new year, my hopes rose. Although neither side had given us their list of war objectives, reports were the German mood had softened, that they were ready to go to arbitration. In the light of this, my close advisor, Colonel Edward House, cabled me this. Mr. President, if these reports prove true, we should soon be able to do something of far-reaching importance. House. Well, it was this, this bloom of hope that led me to go before the Senate and, of course, the world with my own preconditions for peace, an early version of my 14 points. But beneath them was a concept and a proposal which I called peace without victory. Peace without victory. You see, I understood that if either side won a total victory, it would be a victor's terms imposed upon the vanquished, terms accepted only under duress and at enormous sacrifice, leaving only bitter memories. Under those conditions, peace would rest not on solid ground, but on quicksand. Only a peace between equals could beckon peace to come with healing in its wings and come to stay. But as you remember well, my peace without victory proposal, my peace without victory proposal found no takers. In fact, before I even proposed it, the Germans were undermining it. With malice of forethought, the Prussian autocrats earlier in January decided to resume unrestricted submarine warfare, knowing full well that would bring America into the war, but believing they could starve England out before we made our presence felt. Sinkings would begin the first day of February. Oh, Lord, the, the turn of the world now simply reversed itself for me. Once again, we had to face that, that barbaric form of warfare, which, against all maritime precedent and practice, condemned to death without warning or hope of rescue, innocent merchantmen and civilian travelers. I thought that our Lusitania and Sussex protests of 1915 and 1916 would have persuaded the Germans to yield up permanently this form of terrorism, at least for the neutral vessel. But now, now every vessel of whatever class, flag, cargo, or destination was apparently to be ruthlessly sent to the bottom without warning. I say apparently because I could not believe that the Germans would pay no heed to that ancient friendship between America and themselves and being a man who refused to be hurried into action, particularly by popular will, for the next few months, two months to be exact, I watched and I hoped and I worried because I knew that if America became a belligerent in this war, oh, we might not be able to save Europe afterwards. My hope for German sense and reason was a chimera. By March, the 
sinkings of American merchantmen was on the rise, and the only conclusion seemed to be that the German war machine was a threat to the freedom of free men everywhere. But, but it was another act of German perfidy that finally pulled loose my stronghold on neutrality. At about the same time, the German militarists were deciding to relaunch their submarines. The German foreign minister, one Arthur Zimmerman, cabled his ambassador in Mexico City this vile proposal. In the event of a war between Germany and America, if Mexico would join with Germany, Berlin would afterwards return to her territories taken in the 1840s war. Zimmerman. Astonishing what they were planning but to strip away our sovereign states of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. What deceit. What deceit. At the very time that we and they were talking peace and friendship, they were plotting a, a hostile coalition against us, an unholy coalition. They even did their plotting on our undersea cable, which we had generously made available to them uh, to provide secure transmissions for what they claimed would be cables discussing peace. Well, our patience was now at an end. Consequently, on April the 6th, 1917, the Congress, responding to my war message of four days before, declared war on the German Empire. So, belligerent status was now forced upon us. No question. Mr. Weidman, yes, I think that's it. Belligerent status was now thrust upon us without question. But if honor demanded the end of no neutrality, I can tell you with some pride that the ideals and goals which guided us in peace now instructed us in war. Our aim, you see, was not revenge, selfish interests, or the showing of American strength, but only the vindication of human rights, of which America is the world's only champion. Our fight is for the peace of the world, for the privilege of free men everywhere to choose their way of life. Even the Germans, if they would throw over their autocrats. The world must be made safe for democracy by such a coalition of free peoples as would assure justice, peace, and openness to all nations. As for our part in the actual fighting, I think I only need remind you that America surprised the world by the speed with which they put large forces into the fray and by the valor with which they fought. <laughs> Both very unwelcome surprises to the Germans, I can assure you. Well, getting a well-armed America quickly into France was the work chiefly of our great friend Bernard Baruch, who rose from his Camden, South Carolina beginnings to become a multi-millionaire financier. But when war and country called, he set those things aside. As director of our munitions manufacturer, among many other things, Barney was the man to go to to get action. Our military skills shocked the Germans equally. <laughs> Their generals, you see, thought us a fat, rich people 
a nation without honor who would do anything to avoid a war. What they actually met, as when our lads, for example, broke through the uh, impregnable Hindenburg line was something else entirely. An army of courageous, fresh, and battle-ready young men, in this case, uh, boys from the Carolinas and Tennessee of the old Hickory Division, whose attack and success at the Hindenburg Line marked the beginning of the end for the Germans. But victory, victory was only step one. Now came the peacemaking. And it was my deep hope to have that peace without victory I've spoken of, and a League of Nations able to provide lasting peace and justice to all peoples. In this, well, I knew I spoke the minds of a weary mankind. <laughs> I also knew the Allies did not see things as I did. So I realized that no matter its toll on me personally, I would have to enter this battle too. And so I assumed the lead of our peace delegation to the Paris Conference. <laughs> My critics were quickly dismissive, arguing that I only coveted the role of the world's leader. I said, <laughs> well, yes, I did covet that. But for America, not for myself. And we, when we reached Paris last December, well, my optimism rose. The enormous crowds that thronged every Parisian boulevard and avenue shouting, Vive Amérique! And uh, <laughs> Wilson, <laughs> they meant Wilson. <laughs> well, they were astonishing. But I soon was aware of some very grave problems. I already knew about the secret treaties of the Allied powers. This, of course, was what kept them from giving us their war gold. I now discovered the Allies' determination to impose a vengeful settlement upon the Germans. The deep, it was this deep cynicism of the Allied leaders that most distressed me. A Darwinian cynicism, which in politics says the the great shall eat the small, and it will always be so. <laughs> In my presence, the cynical men indulged my league, perhaps because of the great reception we'd received. But what they really were thinking was, oh yes, Wilson, well, we must humor him along so that he won't make a public fuss over it. <laughs> but in the next months, and we were there for six with a brief period home. In the next months, a very curious thing happened. The cynical men found that the League was necessary to set right the flaws that had crept into the treaty. For what had seemed a council of perfection now came to see a plain council of necessity. For the men learned and found that the treaty could not even be implemented without the League. Ultimately, it was made an inseparable part of the treaty itself. Oof. I have to tell you, if I may depart from the story just a minute, I, you know, I have lived in some awfully torrid southern states. Uh, I had homes with my family in Augusta, Georgia, and Columbia, South Carolina, and Wilmington, North Carolina, where it was plenty hot. But I can tell you, I simply do not remember a September this hot as you have here in Pueblo. <laughs> well, I'll try to survive. I almost feel feverish. Well, back to the story. Much has been made, you know, about my joust in Paris with Premier Clemenceau, the Le Tigre de France, the, the Tiger of France. Well, if truth be known, 
<laughs> I like the old man, and I shall miss him. His ideas were mostly straight, <laughs> and he had many lovable qualities. <laughs> but forbearance and suffering fools were not among them. <laughs> the Belgian prime minister once said to him, right after the war started, did he wish there was something he could do for little Belgium? <laughs> Whereupon Clemenceau growled, the best thing you can do for Belgium is resign or die. <laughs> well, as we sailed home in July from these colleagues and scenes, I realized that I had been present at a wonderful time in the history of nations. Nations had often formed compacts, but never partnerships. They had frequently gathered together temporarily, associated together temporarily, but never permanently for permanent world peace. It was this achievement and, and promise which only two days after docking in New York, I optimistically presented to the Senate which, as you know, had to approve the treaty and the league by at least a two-thirds vote. Imagine, then, my consternation and anger when my Republican opposition, now claiming enough votes to sink the treaty, if not greatly amended, proffered not congratulations to me, but abuse and accusation. I was involving the nation in a treaty, they said, that would take from Congress the power to take us to war. If I succeeded, our very independence and constitutional integrity would be compromised. My response to this wrongheadedness? To call over to the White House, two by two and three by three, my Republican opposition to tell them the facts of the league. Surely the best way to correct misinformation, yes? No. The truth is the League was not their target at all. What drove them was political partisanship, pure and simple. They had opposed my 1916 peace plan, for example, with the absurd argument that it would only encourage Europe to meddle in our affairs, undermining the Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> Many Republican senators declared their opposition to the League before we'd even finished drafting it. And just two months ago, the irreconcilables among them pledged to defeat it without without, I am certain, even reading the covenant. But I'm not the only one to see petty political partisanship in play. Many sensible Republicans do as well. For example, esteemed newspaper editor William Allen White of the Emporia, Kansas Gazette has written, the Senate gentlemen are intent on discrediting Wilson for political reasons. They want an issue and are willing to jeopardize the peace of the world to create it. It is small business. Even my two Republican predecessors, Theodore Roosevelt and Bill Taft, <laughs> certainly no fans of mine, have given strong support to the League. President Taft, ex-President Taft, was actually as angry at the Senate Republicans as was Edison White, for he has said, the Senate gentlemen are so full of partisan rage and personal jealousy that they will on no account do their duty. <laughs> this petty political partisanship had its most scandalous uh, appearance the night I reported to the Senate in July. The gentleman winked, thrust tongue in cheek, whispered that I had failed to make good. At the end, they even refused to applaud. What a colossal irony 
In the beginning, the gentleman wanted to get into the war, and they abused me for refusing. Now that they are in and are caught in the web of peacemaking and world responsibility, they want to break out and stay out. <laughs> A moment's indulgence. I simply must cool off. If you'll pardon me and allow me to do this, I know that my dear wife Edith out there is highly embarrassed by my doing something like this, but I'm just in hopes that, much better, that she would rather have a live embarrassment of a husband than one who collapses from a heat stroke. <laughs> well, back to the story again. All of these things explain why I'm here with you in Pueblo. I also know that you have been told that facts are being withheld, that America will be at a disadvantage in the league. Well, whoever has told you that was either deliberately falsifying or had not read the covenant. I am here to tell you the facts of the league, and I will go the limit to win American support for it. Now, what are the facts? Well, the gentlemen tell you that Article 10, the core of the covenant, gives to the League the power to take our nation into war. Article 10, as you likely know, requires every League member to preserve, or commits every League member to preserve and protect the territory of any nation threatened by external aggression and empowers the League's Executive Council to advise ways to do this. But my good friends, do keep this in mind. The Council can only advise, and it cannot do that without the vote of the United States. <laughs> Why gentlemen should fear that Congress would let itself even be advised to do something it doesn't want to do is beyond me. <laughs> Nevertheless, the gentlemen insist on amending Article 10 to reserve explicitly to the Congress the right to approve any recommendation by the League. Not only is this change in the covenant unnecessary, it will delay the passage of the peace treaty indefinitely by forcing it back onto the Paris Conference and require renegotiation by all signatories. Well, this is chiefly what the gentlemen say is wrong with the League. What's right about it? What is essential about it? Most importantly, the League will be a force for lasting peace with its many safeguards and its spirit of openness. No single great nation will ever again be able to do what the Germans did, secretly plot war and begin it with the whole strength of its people whom in this case it did not even consult. But reject the League. Reject the League, and I predict a coming world catastrophe within a generation. Now, it's true, the League is no absolute insurance against war, but I ask you, would you rather have no insurance at all, as the gentlemen seem to prefer? Would you have no probability that war will not recur, but only the probability that it will? I assure you, you do not want those options. I recently walked the battlefield of Ypres and saw where that lovely Belgian city and a distinguished Canadian regiment were ground to bits and where the Germans first made use of poison gas against a foe. 10 million men lost their lives in this war, including some 116,000 of our brave doughboys. 
with the league, we will not have to face such scenes and statistics again. The old nationalistic outlook, which is responsible for them, <laughs> namely that the great powers ought to dominate and direct the destinies of the small, the old nationalistic outlook will give way to a new internationalism, to a new league principle, which is the American principle that the rights and equality of the weak man for the league, the weak nation, are the same as those for the strong. But reject the new internationalism and keep the old nationalism as the gentlemen seem to want, and there'll be another war. Another thing the League will do, it will provide the platform on which America at long last can play its due role in the world. And what's more, prompt and cordial American participation in it will validate the goals and the idealism of our nation, which has earned a new place in the world which it would be folly to impair. You see, Europe believes and trusts America. Don't you see what a compulsion that is? You do not earn a reputation and then fail to live up to it. Finally, finally the League will redeem the pledge we made to our boys who now lie dead in France. We told them they were not fighting to demonstrate American prowess, but to see to it that no such war ever comes again. With the League, well, I can, I can look every mother of the country in the face, and sisters and sweethearts, and tell them the boys will not have to do this again. Fellow citizens, the stage is set. The destiny disclosed, for the League has come about by no plan of our conceiving, but by the hand of God, who has led us in this way. We cannot turn back. We can only go forward with lifted eyes and freshened spirit to follow the vision. It was of this that we dream from our birth. America, in truth, will show the way the light, the light streams only on the path ahead and nowhere else. My good fellow citizens, may I invoke God's blessing to you and to, on our wonderful nation who is seeking to lead the old world into the corridors of liberty. May we always stand for peace. Thank you. Henry, excuse me, Henry Lodge should be here to see this. Even the reservationists among you are welcome to ask a question. It's you that I want to turn in a new direction. Well, I, I am. I felt a little rum today, you know, a fever and difficulty breathing, but I'm sure I'll pep up tonight. Thank you. I think they want to be pepped up, too. I, yes. <laughs> they look like they need a reception or something. <laughs> well, so I, I guess at this point we might as well move on to the next thing. And Thank you so much.